Good morning. Thank you all for joining my presentation today and to the course organizers for inviting me to speak today. I will be providing a broad overview of narcolepsy symptoms and diagnosis, many topics which I'm sure the majority of you are familiar with. Before I begin, I have no relevant disclosures, and I'll start first with an overview of my presentation, which will first include a review of demographics and causes of narcolepsy, then moving on to symptoms, associated conditions, and ending with diagnosis. So as you heard earlier, narcolepsy is a rare condition. So the prevalence of narcolepsy type 1 in the general population is thought to be less than 1%. And as you heard Dr. Silber state earlier, probably 1 out of 2,000 people. The prevalence of narcolepsy type 2 is uncertain, but we do know that it is less common than narcolepsy type 1. Males and females are pretty similarly affected with this condition that often presents at least the symptoms in the initial three decades of life, so prior to the age of 30. But also, as you heard, sometimes or oftentimes the diagnosis may take years to actually make, but the symptoms start early on. As for causes, narcolepsy type 1 is thought to result from a deficiency of certain neuropeptides in the brain known as orexins or hypocretins. So the deficiency is what we think causes narcolepsy type 1. As for the mechanism by which narcolepsy type 2 develops, that is less well understood, but it still may be from a less profound deficiency of those neuropeptides, orexins, and hypocretins or impaired signaling of the related or associated pathways of those neuropeptides. So if we understand that orexins and hypocretins serve to promote and stabilize wakefulness and to suppress REM sleep, it stands to reason that if you disrupt or have, if you have deficiencies of those neuropeptides or you disrupt their pathways, then you're going to be sleepy and or have what we call intrusions of some REM sleep phenomena into the day, which probably explains some of the associated symptoms outside of daytime sleepiness that we will talk about. Genetic factors may play a role in the development of narcolepsy, but also as Dr. Silber stated, that's not the whole story or the whole picture. There are specific HLA types that are listed here that may be associated with an increased risk of developing this condition. That being said, just because you are positive for one of these HLA types does not necessarily mean that you have narcolepsy because up to a quarter of people can be positive for DQB10602, for example. So having a, quote, positive blood test does not mean that you have narcolepsy. There may also be autoimmune factors that play a role in the development of this condition. In particular, certain respiratory infections related to streptococcus or H1N1, or even vaccination especially for H1N1, where the body mounts an immune response to fight off the infection or in response to the vaccination, and then autoantibodies are produced, the antibodies that attack the hypocretin or orexin cells in the deeper structures of the brain. And lastly, structural lesions that involve those deeper structures. Dr. Silber had that very nice diagram demonstrating showing where the hypothalamus is deep in the brain. And if there are structural lesions that affect those structures where our wake sleep centers and REM on REM off centers are located, people can develop what is known as secondary narcolepsy. So now moving on to symptoms. The symptoms of narcolepsy usually develop slowly over months to years. 
And obviously the cardinal and most disabling feature is that of excessive sleepiness that has the biggest quality of life implication as many of you know. Despite this, however, the total 24 hour sleep duration, so the amount of sleep that is attained in a 24 hour period is not necessarily increased in individuals with narcolepsy. And that's probably because a large number of these individuals also have disrupted nocturnal sleep. We do also know that nocturnal and daytime sleeping periods are often refreshing, meaning that mm -hmm. upon awakening in the morning, after a night of sleep, or even during the day after a nap, at least right away, people often feel refreshed, not always, but often. And the daytime sleepiness sets in after a variable period of time. And that varies from one individual to the next, and also depending on what time of day it is for a particular individual. And that daytime sleepiness can manifest in a variety of ways. For some people, and sometimes, it is an urge to fall asleep under a permissive circumstance or situation, such as while reading, watching television, sitting here and listening to me talk or in a public place. In others, there may be sudden sleep attacks where they fall asleep at the drop of a hat in the midst of a conversation, driving, or even walking. And lastly, some may experience lapses in vigilance or what are known as automatic behaviors where they may be having a conversation and they have missed suddenly realized that they missed a piece of the conversation, even though the individual with whom they were speaking noted no gaps or deficiencies in that conversation. Or at other times, they can describe driving from point A to point B, and once they get to point B, don't realize, remember how they got there and have missed their exit, even though there were no deficiencies in driving that were noted. In addition to the variety of ways in which the excessive daytime sleepiness can manifest, there are several associated symptoms. Starting first with what are known as hypnagogic or hypnopompic hallucinations. And these really refer to hallucinations that occur at wake sleep or sleep wake transitions. These hallucinations feel very real. They are vivid dreamlike experiences that often have visual, auditory, and or tactile characteristics, meaning that the individual sees, hears, and feel things that are very real during these experiences. And it's often all of those things together. It's important to recognize that having such hallucinations does not necessarily mean that you have narcolepsy because these hallucinations can also occur in the general population particularly under conditions of sleep deprivation. Sleep paralysis can also occur at wake sleep or sleep wake transitions, and it is characterized by paralysis of voluntary muscles. During these events of sleep paralysis, one's awareness is fully preserved. So understandably, it is a very frightening experience because it can last for up to several minutes in some cases. Sleep paralysis as well, though it is an associated condition, can also occur in the normal or general population. So just because someone has sleep paralysis does not necessarily mean that they have narcolepsy. And now on to cataplexy, which occurs in narcolepsy type one. Cataplexy often develops at the time that an individual starts to experience excessive daytime sleepiness or often within one year of the onset of those excessive daytime sleepiness symptoms. This is a diagnosis that us as providers really rely on um, the history that the patient gives us about what they're experiencing because we very infrequently will actually witness a cataplexy episode in the clinical setting in our office. If we do see an episode of cataplexy in the office and we check the individual's reflexes, during the event or episode of cataplexy, the reflexes are transiently lost or absent. And once the cataplexy episode is ended, the reflexes come back. 
So for us, if we see it, which I, has happened maybe once in my 14 years in practice, that's usually what we'll see. But otherwise, we're really relying on the clinical history to make that diagnosis. So what are the features of cataplexy? Well, it's often brief, usually lasting for under two minutes. And during, um, sorry, and when an individual is drowsy or sleepy, the cataplexy episodes tend to be longer, more frequent, or maybe even more severe. And that's why when Dr. Silber was speaking earlier today, he talked about how you really work on, you know, when you improve the alertness or daytime sleepiness, that sometimes the cataplexy will also improve. Cataplexy is precipitated by emotions that are often positive emotions. So the common triggers can be laughter. So telling a joke, laughing at a joke, or surprise. Negative emotions can also trigger cataplexy, such as sadness or anger, but it's unlikely that cataplexy is triggered only by negative emotions. So it's often a mixture of the two or only positive emotions. Cataplexy involves bilateral and symmetric, so both sides of the body are equally affected, loss of muscle tone. The commonly involved regions of the body include the face, particularly the lower face or jaw, the neck where the head may droop or drop forward, or even the legs where the knees may buckle and in severe cases, people drop to the ground. Sometimes there are positive motor phenomena, which are episodes of twitching that can accompany that loss of muscle tone, especially involving the lower face. During an episode of cataplexy, awareness and sensation are fully preserved. So now moving on to associated conditions. There is a higher incidence of increased body weight, obesity, or even precocious puberty in certain age groups uh, with narcolepsy, particularly at the onset of the symptoms. In addition, there is increased association with other sleep conditions. And this is really important for us as providers to understand because if somebody has been well controlled on medication for a number of years and suddenly their daytime sleepiness symptoms start to break through, we often will think about, well, is there another sleep condition here that could explain those symptoms like obstructive sleep apnea, or periodic limb movements occurring in association with restless legs that might be fragmenting their sleep at night. In addition, those with narcolepsy have uh, increased sleep-related nocturnal behaviors, sleepwalking, and a condition known as REM sleep behavior disorder, where the individual may have vivid dreams that they act out at night, vocalizing arm and leg movements, falling out of bed, etc. There is also increased association with psychiatric conditions, and we don't fully understand the mechanism there, or is it just a response to the disabling condition? But there's a higher incidence of depression, anxiety, and attention deficit disorder, especially in children. So now moving on to diagnosis. It's important to recognize that not all symptoms of excessive daytime sleepiness are due to narcolepsy. And for this reason, it's very important that anybody with excessive daytime sleepiness complaints has a thorough history and examination conducted by a sleep medicine provider. And that history really involves a careful review of the onset of those excessive daytime sleepiness symptoms, what they're like, what are the other associated symptoms that they might have, and a careful review of sleep and wake patterns, making sure that the individual is getting enough sleep and regular sleep, so they're not doing shift work, for example, and that may be an explanation for their sleepiness, and also exploring if they have other symptoms that may suggest the presence of another sleep disorder, like obstructive sleep apnea or leg movements at night that are fragmenting to the sleep. Objective testing is essential when making a diagnosis of narcolepsy simply because that diagnosis often requires a lifelong commitment to medications, which you just heard about this morning. 
And so we really want to make sure that we're assigning the correct diagnosis when someone comes in with excessive sleepiness. The gold standard diagnostic tool that we use in sleep medicine for making this diagnosis is a test known as a multiple sleep latency test, abbreviated MSLT, and sometimes called a daytime nap study. The MSLT involves giving the individual four or five opportunities to nap during the day, separated by two hour intervals usually, and seeing and measuring how quickly they can fall asleep under a permissive circumstance, so in a dark, quiet room. And we measure that falling asleep through electrodes that are placed on the scalp via brainwave recording. Thanks. Though the MSLT is an excellent tool and the gold standard tool that we use for diagnosing this condition, it is a test that is very easily influenced by other factors. And so it really needs to be completed under very controlled circumstances, meaning that the individual has had enough sleep for at least a week prior, they're getting regular sleep, so they're not traveling across time zones or shift working, and et cetera. So we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail now. Prior to conducting an MSLT, we like to see adequate and regular sleep that has been demonstrated for at least one week prior to the test. So this is immediately prior to the test and sometimes longer. We do that through two methods. The first is sleep logs, which simply is a diary of the individual writing down when they've gone to bed, when they've woken up, when they've napped during the day, and sort of what their alertness has been throughout various parts of the day. We often will then complement that with objective sleep-wake testing through an actigraphy monitor, which is another diagnostic tool that we have. It is a wristwatch-like device that is worn 24-7 that has an accelerometer built into it. And that accelerometer detects movement. And the presumption is that when you move more, you're probably awake. And when you move less, you're probably sleeping. So we use that to complement the sleep logs that are provided by individuals to document adequate sleep and regular sleep. So we really just kind of want to see what that pattern has looked like for at least a week. In addition, we do an in-lab polysomnography or sleep study. And we do that the night immediately prior to the daytime nap test. And that serves two purposes. The first is to make sure that the individual actually had enough hours of sleep before we put them into the daytime nap study situation. Obviously, if they you know, slept only four hours a night before at home and they woke up at four in the morning to show up for the daytime nap test, that's not ideal. They're going to be sleepy because they didn't get enough sleep. And so we want to control for that in the lab. And the sleep study helps us to make sure that there isn't evidence for sleep apnea, or excessive leg movements that might be fragmenting to the sleep, things that we would want to, that would make us pause and maybe address first before pursuing the daytime nap test if the individual still is sleepy after treating those conditions. And probably the most important piece or one of the important pieces as well is ensuring that potentially confounding medications and or substances are not being taken for at least two weeks prior to the MSLT. There are a lot of medications and or substances that individuals take and that they don't realize could potentially be sedating and or stimulating. And so when we do a daytime nap study, we wanna make sure that we're testing the individual in their native or purest form. So over-the-counter drugs like antihistamines, which are commonly contained in allergy, cough, and cold formulations, should ideally be stopped for at least two weeks. A variety of prescription drugs as well, including antidepressants, antipsychotics, mood stabilizers, or stimulants, because those can all affect the results of the MSLT. And lastly, drugs of abuse, which can be either sedating or stimulating, depending upon the substance at hand. 
also if the individual has demonstrated regular and adequate sleep for at least a week, doesn't have evidence for another sleep condition demonstrated on the sleep study, which also shows adequate sleep, and there are no potentially confounding medications and or substances on board for at least two weeks, and you go move forward with a daytime nap test. As I stated earlier, you're measuring how quickly an individual can fall asleep over four or five nap opportunities. And if they fall asleep in an average of less than or equal to eight minutes, they are considered to be excessively sleepy. In addition, if they enter REM sleep in two or more of those four or five nap opportunities, they fulfill the diagnostic criteria for narcolepsy. So there's two pieces to the MSLT. We're not only looking at how quickly somebody falls asleep, we're also looking at have they entered REM sleep, and if so, on how many of those naps. There are some clinical situations where you may not be able to conduct the MSLT under or appropriate circumstances. You have somebody who has untreated sleep apnea and you're really struggling to get that under treatment, but you're still concerned that they might have narcolepsy. Or more commonly, you can't stop potentially confounding medications. They really need to be on their antidepressant and they can't safely stop that for at least two weeks or other situations. The MSLT is not validated for use in children under the age of six. So if you have a child that you are uh, evaluating for excessive daytime sleepiness, we will often think about other strategies. So the strategy that we will think about is measuring the cerebrospinal fluid hypocretin or orexin levels. And this can be helpful for diagnosing narcolepsy type one. Now, the way we obtain that cerebrospinal fluid is through a procedure known as a lumbar puncture study, which involves placing a small needle into the low back. Prior to subjecting the individual to that sort of a procedure, however, we often will complete a blood HLA test. Remember, we talked about some of those HLA types that may be associated with narcolepsy because a blood test is a much less invasive test. And if that test is negative, then it's very, very, very unlikely that they are going to have low levels of hypocretin or orexin. So we would often just stop at that point and not do the spinal fluid test. On the other hand, if the blood HLA typing is positive, then we'd want to look further through that spinal tap and obtain the fluid to actually measure the hypocretin levels. Remember, I stated earlier that if even if the blood HLA test is positive, it doesn't mean someone has narcolepsy because up to a quarter of the general population can be positive for that, but still not have narcolepsy. So if through a spinal fluid analysis, the levels or values of hypocretin are less than or equal to, it should be less than or equal to 110, then those values are highly specific for narcolepsy type 1. So this is another diagnostic tool that we can use when trying to assess if someone has narcolepsy type 1. It doesn't help us with narcolepsy type 2, um, usually preceded by the blood HLA typing first. So in conclusion, narcolepsy is a rare condition that often presents in the first three decades of life. And it is thought to result from either orexin hypocretin deficiencies or disruptions in the related or associated pathways. And there are many factors that may contribute to its development, including genetic, autoimmune, structural, or other causes. In addition to the cardinal and most disabling feature of excessive daytime sleepiness, there are other associated symptoms that can occur, including cataplexy in type 1 and sleep paralysis and hallucinations, which, remember, are nonspecific. They can also occur in the general population. There are associated conditions of obesity, other sleep disorders, and psychiatric conditions that can Occur with increased association. Objective test 
testing via the gold standard diagnostic tool, the MSLT is essential prior to making a lifelong commitment to medication. Mm -hmm. But remember that that MSLT is very easily influenced by a variety of other factors that need to be controlled for, as we talked about, regular and adequate sleep, no other sleep conditions, no potentially confounding medications and or substances on board. And in some clinical scenarios, when the MSLT cannot be appropriately completed, especially when you're looking for narcolepsy type 1, you can consider or we can consider a cerebral spinal fluid analysis looking for hypocretin deficiency. So with that, I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Hi, just a couple of questions. Um, um, they, there's been talk within the sleep community about the MWT versus the MSLT. And when you think about it, um, you know, the MWT people are trying, you know, the intention is to try to stay awake despite being in a dim environment. And so that is more similar to what people are experiencing. Their motivation is to try to stay awake. So any thoughts on that? And then my other question is about how do patients find out about um, testing? Because I was at a sleep lab for 30 years and we didn't have anyone in St. Louis to do testing. At that point in time, we had to send everything to Emmanuel Mignot if you wanted to have testing done. So what's the current status of getting um, blood work or, or CSF levels? Mm -hmm. So great questions. I'll answer uh, the first question that you posed, which is an excellent question in regard to doing an MSLT to make the diagnosis versus doing a maintenance of wakefulness test, which as you heard from Dr. Silber earlier today is slightly different. You're actually being told to maintain alertness during the day, which maybe is more practical and related to the real world experience. So the diagnostic criteria only um, reference the MSLT. So when we actually make the diagnosis, that is really the test that we have to use because we know what the criteria are. That being said, from a clinical perspective, I personally will use the MWT when I am trying to track treatment response. So somebody is on a medication treatment regimen and it doesn't, they don't feel like it's fully working or it's unclear if their residual symptoms are really sleepiness or fatigue. Under those circumstances, I have utilized the MWT to help guide my treatment decision. I have not used it for diagnosis, but probably because that's what most of us do, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's good. Um, it's a good question. I don't think all of us know the answer to what's to come, but at least for now we have the, the gold standard. And your other question was related to, um, I'm sorry. Well, oh, yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. So um, we do do them here, and I would suspect that a lot of other large academic institutions do as well. Do any of you, I'm looking to my colleagues here, know right off the top of your head what other labs or facilities would do that testing? Correct. Are there other sites that are, I, I, I'm i thinking there are other sites that are also doing the Stanford, maybe Emory. Um, for clinical testing, okay. Correct.
Correct. So I think the first step would be, you know, obtain that HLA blood test because that's widely available. And if that test is negative, then you can stop there. But if it's positive, then yes, contact, you know, have your sleep provider contact their colleagues to see where it's clinically available. I do know that it's done here. And I do know that we receive a lot of send out samples. But as Dr. Lipford was stating, though, there may be other academic institutions that are doing it, it may be under research protocols, and not clinical protocols, but we do do it here, clinically. Other questions? Hello. Hi. I just want to say, I am wildly impressed by you just advocating for your patients. I love that so much. That makes me so happy as somebody with narcolepsy. So I have two questions for you. I often see in the support groups as far as types of devices, Apple Watches that can adequately and accurately kind of show whether or not somebody is what phase of sleep they're in. Is that a thing? Like, can you just put something on your wrist to tell you if you're in REM sleep or not? Because I've been seeing a lot of it and I just kind of want to. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the first question. Then the second okay. question is, if somebody has cataplexy, do they have narcolepsy? Now, because I heard you use the language general population, which I love because up until this point, I didn't know how to say people who don't have the same thing I got, right? So I love the language of general population. But like, is cataplexy, like if you have cataplexy, then you for sure have narcolepsy? Is that a thing? That's your second question. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So let me tackle the, since I'll tackle the first question first. So as far as consumer-based tracking devices that monitor sleep and wake and provide reports of how much deep, light, or dream sleep one is getting, what we do know about those devices is that they are pretty accurate at distinguishing sleep from wake. But as far as identifying sleep architecture, meaning light sleep, deep sleep or dream sleep, we really don't know. And it's obviously not a brainwave measurement. I'm a neurologist, so <laughs> I may be biased, but um, we don't know. So I often will counsel my patients that yes, you can certainly use your tracking device to tell you how much sleep you're getting, because sometimes that in and of itself is revealing and eye-opening if you're not getting enough. But I don't put a lot of stock into the light, deeper dream sleep. It probably it will come at some point, but not now, at least at present. And as for your uh, second question, I'm blanking for a moment. I'm trying to remember your second question. Sorry. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. So as I stated, it can be challenging to really um, make the diagnosis of cataplexy based on the history alone. But if you're pretty sure as a sleep medicine provider, when you're talking to a patient that that is really what they're describing um, and or um, you actually witness it in the office, then that should only occur in association with narcolepsy with very, very rare and few exceptions. Right. Uh, it's very common that it could be there could be a, a, no activation of this vagal system that drops our blood pressure that can make people sometimes limp. But usually there's other symptoms as well as, you know, there is uh, shadowing, uh, darkening the periphery. People may lose awareness or not. Uh, but sometimes that this vasovagal kind of reaction can be very similar to cataplex because it can also be triggered by even a hard laugh sometimes or particularly getting, you know, scared or ang angry at something very uh, abruptly. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Carvalho. And I just wanted to add that there are there are cases in the literature of, yes, isolated cataplexy occurring with other types of genetic metabolic disorders like Neiman-Pick type C and some others. 
but you would know if you had some of those other conditions because you'd have other symptoms as well. I have a related question from one of our virtual uh, viewers. Uh, it says uh, it was uh, mentioned that cataplexy trigger is triggered by negative emotions only, is unlikely, but this person has uh, gets it only uh, in uh, positive emotion, uh, uh, only with negative emotions, not with positive emotions. So to clarify, yes, often the trigger is a positive emotion. Um, it's often not only negative emotion, but that's often not. So that doesn't mean that it can't ever happen, but it's less common. So I hope that clarifies. Um, I had a question about sleep testing and how often or do you um, regularly repeat a sleep test after you have a positive narcolepsy diagnosis? And if you do repeat um, a sleep test to, you know, look for sleep apnea or some other uh, sleep disorder, is the medications that the patient's on an issue um, when looking for those other sleep disorders. So if I understand your question correctly, um, your question was, when would you repeat a sleep study? I'm thinking, right, the overnight study. Um, so I would repeat the overnight study if an individual has been well controlled with medication for some period of time, and now suddenly their symptoms are breaking through without another clear explanation. And one of the most common things that I'll see is an individual has been on stimulants for years, and now they're getting older and suddenly their bed partner has noted that they're snoring. And so we think that maybe there's sleep apnea. And so we'll do a test to look for sleep apnea. Under those circumstances, when we're looking for those other conditions, those medications that are confounders don't apply because those are those medications are confounders only for the MSLT, not for the overnight sleep study. Hello. Okay. Um, you had said earlier on that uh, type two narcolepsy was less prevalent than type one narcolepsy. And do you have any thoughts about that being related to underreporting because cataplexy is not there and a prominent symptom that something is going wrong? Because I was diagnosed like two years ago and I had no idea. I never thought I had narcolepsy. And nobody ever really brought it up to me until very recently. And I just wonder if there's a lot of underreporting because it's not something that doctors really even think about most of the time. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point and a point well taken. I think it's, yes, absolutely, that it, that is very well possible. And, and that's why we say that it's less certain, you know, less certain how common it is because for, for the reasons that you outlined exactly. Okay, thank you. And then I had one more question. Um, I know that this will probably come out years from now. There'll be a lot of research about various things that have resulted from COVID, but do you feel like you've heard any chatter about COVID being maybe one of those um, infectious events like H1N1 that has sparked maybe worsening or new narcolepsy? I have not heard of that, nor am I aware of that in the literature. I'm just looking to my colleagues here to see if anybody has any insights in that respect. I, I think there there's more to come, obviously, as you stated. So you yeah, just uh, referring to the lack of knowledge on incidents of narcolepsy post COVID, but uh, personally, I had uh, recently diagnosed a patient with idiopathic hypersomnia. Uh, that uh, presented with symptoms of study after uh, uh, an infection with COVID and post-COVID kind of symptoms. So something that we, we get certainly in the lookout and uh, there is, you know, reports of hypersomnia. It, it's usually the post-COVID syndrome presents more with fatigue and we have made a distinction between fatigue and sleepness as Dr. Silva had pointed out, but there are a few patients that do present with significant degree of hypersomnia, though I uh, haven't seen uh, much in terms of meeting criteria for narcolepsy per se. Okay. A couple of other questions coming up. Um, can narcolepsy symptoms worsen over time? 
And can narcolepsy symptoms in women be impacted or more severe during hormonal changes each month? So um, as for the first question about symptoms worsening over time, I think that's really difficult to sort out because as Dr. Silber outlined, um, one can develop tolerance to the stimulant medications over time as well. So if symptoms worsen, it's unclear if that's a progression of the disease or if that's tolerance to the medication or, as I alluded to earlier, are there other sleep conditions that are developing or evolving that may be leading to those symptoms? Um, as for symptoms worsening for women during certain portions of their menstrual um, cycle or period, monthly period, that's a tough one um, because I don't know if we actually have any studies that have measured that or looked at that. However, we do know that there can be other sort of premenstrual types of symptoms that can also occur. And so it may be a little bit difficult to sort out what is what in that situation. Uh, one other question, uh, does knowing the type of narcolepsy someone has clinically relevant, that is understanding if there was structural damage post uh, hemorrhagic stroke versus N1 or N2? I would say that from a clinical perspective, the treatment would really be the same. Um, but there are some instances where, you know, an individual may have some sort of a central nervous system lesion, like a multiple sclerosis related demyelinating lesion or other things. And so if you suspect, at least as providers, if we suspect that the cause is secondary, we would typically image the brain because if there is a condition there that warrants treatment that is outside of our realm, like for a de demyelinating illness, for example, we would want to get the patient plugged in. So yes, it's relevant if we think that there's secondary narcolepsy and in those situations, we would typically get an MRI of the brain to look for that sort of thing. I hope that answers that question. So I often document my journey with narcolepsy on my social medias, such as TikTok and Instagram and whatnot. And after documenting one of my episodes, I found myself, as I was recording myself and still coherent, my eyes rolling in the back of my head and a lot of the times when I experience my symptoms, specifically excessive daytime sleepiness, I think I find myself wanting to look up at lights or I don't know how to explain it. I find myself more likely to want to look up and to my eyes roll in the back of my head. And I don't know what to actually call that. I don't know what the language is for that. I don't know if you've ever heard anything like that. I've also been told that when it comes to experiencing sleep paralysis, and cataplexy, and you tell me if this is wrong or not, um, that in layman's terms, because that erection, the hypocretin is like, you know, bye-bye, and your body's like, hey, you know, dream, basically, right, just in layman's terms, um, that that is why your body isn't moving anymore. Like, that is the reason why maybe the cataplexy occurs, or that is the reason why the sleep paralysis is happening is because of the um, your body saying just because it can't regulate when you dream. Correct. Does that make sense? I don't know. If yeah, no, I, I, I think I understand your your comment and your question correctly. So, yes, since uh, orexin and hypocretin do, as we talked about, in addition to promoting wakefulness, the other function is also to um, suppress REM sleep, if you are deficient in those neuropeptides or those pathways are not working correctly, you can have REM sleep phenomena intrude into wakefulness. And we do know that during REM sleep, our bodies are normally or naturally paralyzed. And so maybe that's the feature behind or, or the theory behind sleep paralysis and cataplexy. And then the hallucinations are very dreamlike. And so is that also a REM intrusion? At least that's what the thinking is. Yes, that language, REM intrusion. That's that's what I heard. Yes. And then as for your earlier comment about your eyes rolling upward and, you know, sleepiness can manifest in a variety of ways for everybody. Everybody is different. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Another question. Yes, I have a question. 
Um, so I have family members myself. I have three family members, four of us who have been diagnosed with narcolepsy. Um, but I have been at different times diagnosed with narcolepsy, IH, hypersomnolence. Are these just, is it that doctors are just interpreting the results differently or are they just so nuanced that they can kind of be one and the same? So um, the MSLT or the gold standard diagnostic tool that we talked about, um, the results are often pretty consistent from one time that you test to the next when somebody has narcolepsy type 1. But with narcolepsy type 2, sometimes there may be variability. And so in my practice, what I've done is if I'm if the diagnosis is not clear, I have repeated the test and taken the, the one that's completed under the most appropriate of circumstances and really held that to be probably the most reliable. But yeah, we didn't talk about IH or idiopathic hypersomnia, but the diagnostic criteria are different in that the number of times the individual enters REM sleep during the MSLT is less than two times. So we talked about for narcolepsy, it's two or more. And for idiopathic hypersomnia, usually that latency would still be under eight minutes, but less than two REM periods. So that's really the distinction that we make when we're making the diagnosis. Thank you. You're welcome. Test, we test with MSLT in patient narcolepsy type 2 and showed that it's not great, okay? And the one that I remember more uh, that I thought was well done showed like a 31% of patients could switch from narcolepsy type 2 to idiopathic hypersomnia and vice versa upon retesting. So it's not negligible. So that may not necessarily be a, a, a problem with the, um, the, the interpretation of the test, but maybe the repetition of the test as well. Now, there is... You know, there was a major study now took thousands of patients with narcolepsy and tried to characterize them based on their fear and their characteristics using artificial intelligence. And they were not able to distinguish really well narcolepsy type two from idiopathic hypersomnia, you know, when looking at hypersomnia patients in general, okay? So uh, that's why there's a push maybe to trans to create just an narcolepsy spectrum disorder kind of diagnosed, they're incompatible. There's the idiopathic hypersomnia with long sleep type, there may be a different group, but, uh, so it, it, we are evolving in terms of trying to understand what's the differences and whether it matters or not. A uh, couple of quick questions. Uh, could a serious seizure event degenerate orexin and cause N1? And the second one is, is white matter disease related to narcolepsy? So the first question about could a serious seizure cause um destruction to the hypocretin orexin producing cells in the brain. I'm not aware of any literature in that regard. And the second question, can narcolepsy be associated or cause white matter changes in the brain? I'm not aware of a relationship there either. I suppose, yes. If So not narcolepsy directly, but if, 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 the, if the individual has secondary narcolepsy and the white matter changes are due to another condition, then yes. Thank you. 